How's that? All good? All righty. Well, it's a few minutes after, so I figure we'll get started. Um, thank you all for coming. It's the end of a long couple of days, and it's always nice to have the post-lunch spot where everyone's like super awake and super alert. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, so I'm Paul. I uh, moved to the States about 16 years ago. And sort of curious fact about me, I was actually born here in Boston, uh, well, born in Boston, moved back as an adult, and I had this curious setup of moving here in my 30s with no credit. Um, I owned a home in London. I had a nice job over there and all of those things, but no credit here in the US. And then another curious thing happened to me. The first job I had in the States, I was um, freelancing for Fidelity in Boston, and um, I didn't have a social security number, despite being a 33-year-old American, which you can imagine how eyebrow-raising that is to many people. Um, but I went down to the, um, the bank that was in the lobby of, of our offices. Um, it was um, Sovereign Bank, now Santander, and told them, like, hey, like, I work upstairs, but like, I don't have a social. Can I have a bank account, please? And like. Oh, yeah, sure. Like, you look like you're legit. Show us your employee badge, and we'll give you a bank account. And I realized that there were some curiosities going on there around um, the things that were available to me based on who I was and me coming to the States and me looking the way I look and me being in a shirt with an employee badge for, for Fidelity. And it sort of set me on this path thinking about how uh, inclusion is... Um, we, f we find inclusivity in tech. And so after doing a stint of freelance work for a number of retail banks, I was at Adobe for six or seven years, basically building uh, user experiences on top of legacy tech. And then, uh, let's see, late in 2012, 2013, I decided I wanted to do two things, build my own business and make that business mission driven. And I wasn't quite sure what else I needed or wanted to do with it. Um, but in the process, I was introduced to the Robin Hood Foundation, which, in case you don't know, is a big charitable foundation in New York. And they were trying to set up a program. And they said, hey, you know, there's all these smart people in tech and product in our industry who are, frankly, really good at building products for rich white kids with iPhones. Wouldn't it be good to put some of that brain trust towards underserved markets, namely low- and middle-income Americans? And in the course of helping them figure out how to build a program to put people together who didn't quite know what they wanted to build yet but wanted to do some good in the world, I realized it would be a great chance for me to find a like-minded co-founder. Um, I met my, well, now ex-co-founder, Avi. His background's in finance. Mine, as you've heard, is technology. And this sort of set me on the path of building mission-driven fintech, which is what I've been doing for the last seven years or so. Now, Alice... Um, if you go and look at it today, what, we, what they do is they make pre-tax spending automatic for people. The mission is to raise people's paychecks by a dollar an hour without asking the employer to spend any extra money. Um, but the story I want to tell you that I think relates to what I'm um, looking at here is something really curious that we found very early on. We started out as a microfinance loan platform. And what we found was that as we were lending money to um, very low income folk, and we were doing it in the form of lending them Metro cards that they paid back in weekly installments, um, we actually found that we got extraordinarily good repayment behaviors. And the reason was that we started from a principle of um, treating people from the position of uh, they're good humans and they're gonna do the right thing, and providing levels of flexibility to allow them to pay back that mapped to the way that their life worked. Six years on from building that, I um, moved on to a company called Daylight. Founded that with my co-founders, Rob and Billy, uh, late last year. And what Daylight does is our mission is to close the LGBT wealth gap. And our sort of first part of that is launching a neobank in the next month or so um, for the LGBT community. And to me, this is the opportunity and challenge of, of a lifetime, to do something to help my community. Um, and I've also realized in the last few months how much of a challenge it is to build 
technology, particularly financial technology, for a group who are historically excluded and marginalized and tend to be very suspicious of me and everyone else in this room purely because of what we do. And so I want to share with you today some of the learnings I've had over the last few months, over the last few years, about what I think it means to build inclusive tech. And hopefully I'll give you a few things you can take away for yourselves that, that may be useful for you in your businesses. But before we dive in, let's look at some legacy technology. Um, who recognizes this? OK, so none of you know what a map is. Cool. Um, let me reframe it. Who remembers having something like this on the wall of their school classroom? OK, there we go. Now, for me, it's a little different. I had this view. No, Britain's in the middle. I grew up in London. And for folks who lived in Asia, they might see something like this. Now, none of these are intrinsically right or wrong. What we're looking at here is a model. It's a 2D representation of a 3D object from the viewpoint of different consumers. And whilst we might think that these are good and decent models, they're actually very, very flawed. And I'm actually going to lean on Aaron Sorkin to tell the story for me about why those maps are pretty flawed. Hi, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry to be late. Not a problem. I'm CJ Craig. Of course you are. I'm Dr. John Fallow. This is Dr. Cynthia Sales and uh, Professor Donald Huke. Huke? Huke. Okay, and you are the Organization of Cartographers for Social Equality. Well, we're, uh, we're from the OCSE. We have many members. How many? 4,300 dues-paying members. What are the dues? Uh, $20 a year for the newsletter. Let's start. Wait. Wait, I want to see this. This is Josh Lyman. Indeed you are. Josh, this is Dr. Fallow, and Hi. his merry men. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Should we begin? Yes. Plain and simple. Uh, We'd like President Bartlett to aggressively support legislation that would make it mandatory for every public school in America to teach geography using the Peters projection map instead of the traditional Mercator. Give me 200 bucks and it's done. Really? No. Why are we changing maps? Uh, because, CJ, the Mercator projection has fostered European imperialist attitudes for centuries and created an ethnic bias against the third world. Really? The German cartographer, Mercator, originally designed this map in 1569 as a navigational tool for European sailors. The map enlarges areas at the poles to create straight lines of constant bearing or geographic direction. So it makes it easier to cross an ocean. <coughs> but yes. it distorts the relative size of nations and continents. Are you saying the map is wrong? Oh dear, yes. Uh, look at Greenland. OK. Now look at Africa. OK. The two land masses appear to be roughly the same size. Yes. Would it blow your mind if I told you that Africa is, in reality, 14 times larger? Yes. Here we have Europe drawn considerably larger than South America. When it's 6.9 million square miles, South America is almost double the size of Europe's 3.8 million. Alaska appears three times as large as Mexico, when Mexico is larger by 0.1 million square miles. Germany appears in the middle of the map when it's in the northernmost quarter of the Earth. Wait, wait. Relative size is one thing, but you're telling me that Germany isn't where we think it is? Nothing is where you think it is. Where is it? I'm glad you asked. The Peters projection. It has fidelity of axis. Fidelity of position. East-west lines are parallel and intersect north-south axes at right angles. What the hell is that? It's where you've been living this whole time. Should we continue? Uh-huh. So, you're probably wondering what all this has to do with social equality. No, I'm wondering where France really is. Guys, we want to thank you very much for coming in. Hang on, we're going to finish this. Okay. What do maps have to do with social equality, you ask? She asked. Salvatore Natoli of the National Council for Social Studies argues, in our society, we unconsciously equate size with importance and even power. I'm going to check in on Tommy. Go. These guys find Brigadoon on that map, you'll call me, right? Probably not. Okay. 
When third world countries are misrepresented, they're likely to be valued less. When Mercator maps exaggerate the importance of Western civilization, when the top of the map is given to the Northern Hemisphere and the bottom is given to the Southern, then people will tend to adopt top and bottom attitudes. But wait, how... Where else could you put the Northern Hemisphere but on the top? <coughs> on the bottom. How? Like this. Yeah, but you can't do that. Why not? Because it's freaking me out. So, I want to point out a few things there. One, Aaron Sorkin's a much better writer than I could ever possibly be, and I will lean on him anytime I can. Um, two, this problem isn't new. So, the maps that we are all fundamentally used to were built to solve a technology problem, which was seafaring navigation, and they have this unintended consequence of misrepresentation of landmass. And um, I think the other thing that's worth taking away from this um, video that's like, it's, it's kind of cute and funny and it's a throwaway line, but CJ at the end saying, wait, wait, this change is freaking me out. And so when one starts to think about building inclusive tech, you can find yourself in a place where you're building things that are change and different for the majority and they can feel a little uncomfortable sometimes. And so I just want to point out, like, none of this stuff that we're looking at is going to be, like, easy, fast, and a three-step notion. But let's look at what I mean when I say inclusive tech. It's not just code. Um, when I think about what this room of people do, code is just the output of what a bunch of humans are doing trying to solve a problem. And so when I think of inclusive fintech, I think of it as product, technology, and teams that maximize for human values, that are aware of the system's inherent weaknesses, and that strive to create a world that we want rather than reflect a world that we have. Um, so now we know what I think it is. Let's talk about some principles by which I think we can start to look at building inclusive technology. Um, I'm going to share some of the learnings I made. Some of them are super tactical. Some of them are more philosophical. Um, join me in this ride. First one, respect identity. So when you meet your customers and you cherish the identity that they've actually shared with you, what you're doing is that you're treating them with respect and treating them as the human that they are. Um, demonstrating respect for those people are the people that put roofs over your head and puts food on your table. Your customers are the thing that makes your business survive, <laughs> unless you're funded by VC dollars, but that's a whole different story. Pronouns. Pronouns matter. Um, encourage your users and your workmates to share them, and share them early and share them freely, um, and use them. Every time you misgender someone, what you're doing is you're showing ignorance as to their identity and you're not seeing them as them. Um, inevitably, what you do when you do that is you lose trust. And so, not only are you losing trust, but you're not treating your customers as the humans that they are. Names matter. Um, names are the very representation of identity. Um, for my business, it's very important. Daylight was one of the first um, neobanks to be able to put your chosen name on your card regardless of what's printed on your legal identity. Um, there's a few other banks that are doing it. Um, and it's not just for folk who are transitioning. There's folk who um, have been given a westernized name and choose to use a, uh, uh, a name that represents their heritage recognize these things as necessary in order, to, in order to see the identity of your users. So I'm an engineer, and I'll, I'll, I'll step into coding for a moment. Some tactical stuff of the last two slides, and this is really the only place where this kind of goes into code. Um, when you do add pronouns, don't call them preferred pronouns. They are just people's pronouns. And when you add what I'll call here, for the sake of simplicity, someone's chosen name or preferred name, it's their name. It's not chosen, it's not preferred, it's their name. Um, legal ID, legal name. Um, and think about the entire customer journey. So I want to share, to share with you a story of uh, my co-founder, Billy, who is a trans woman. And she signed up for 
uh, one of the other bank's true name products. Uh, true name, in case you're not aware, is the idea that you can have your chosen name, your name printed on your card, regardless of legal ID. Signed up for it, got the card in the mail, went to sign into her uh, banking portal. She's dead named. Gets mail from the bank. It has her dead name on it. So when you do this, you have to think about the entire customer journey from, in my case, from card to website to um, customer support to operations. And also that journey extends outside of, um, outside of what you might be building. It extends into your vendors. So I happen to be lucky enough to have one of my vendors here, Gil. And when we first uh, started working with Astra, we had this conversation with them about the necessity of being able to pass to Gil uh, not only legal ID, which was needed in order to fulfill the, the, the work that we were doing with them, um, but also have someone's name sent along with that so that in communications that Astra sent out to us, our customers wouldn't be dead named. So, excuse me, when you have an opportunity to work with vendors, talk to them about how they think about those things too. I'll step to a moment to think about, uh, or to talk about things called representational harms. So, representational harms occur when systems reinforce the uh, subordination or stereotype of some groups along the line of identity. And I think this is a really nice example. So, uh, this is uh, Google Translate going from English to Turkish, Turkish back to English. Turkish doesn't represent gender in their grammar. That's about as much as I know about Turkish grammar, so forgive me. Um, but what you see is when you go English to Turkish, Turkish to English, all of a sudden, she is a software engineer becomes he is a software engineer, and he is a receptionist becomes she is a receptionist. There was a project done um, to look at how different roles were represented online. Um, this is a Google image search for CEOs. And as you can see, it's overwhelmingly men there. And the research that was done said, OK, well, let's look at this across a whole bunch of, um, whole bunch of professions and look at the prevalence of gender in those professions and how closely does what we see map to what currently exists. And what they found was by and large, it actually did map to what you see today. And so it prompts the question and the provocation that should our systems represent present state or should they start to represent the state of the world that we want to be? I don't have a clear answer for you on it, but I think it's something that's worth thinking about. Let's move on. Build systems that represent human values. So I'm going to take you on a little journey for this one. Um, imagine a system, this system's all about llamas, um, that's going to predict if these llamas are going to be late for work more than, say, 10% of the time. This is my llama population. And as you can see, 3 out of 10 are late more than 10% of the time. And I've built my predictor. And my predictor's pretty good. I'm able to see that my, I, I can predict who's going to be late about two-thirds of the time. And now we're going to try and use this predictor against another group of llamas. These are my yellow llamas. And the yellow llamas, as you can see, are late more often. But when I apply my predictor to it, um, it still gets it right about two-thirds of the time. So you could ask yourself, is this predictor treating these llama populations evenly and fairly? Well, maybe. Let's take a closer look. So if we go back to our green llamas, we can see that these guys have a false negative rate of one in three, and a false positive rate of one in seven. And for the yellow llamas, false negative rate also one in three, but a false positive rate of 50%, one in two. So what that means is that for these two different populations, because the prevalence of their tardiness is a little different, um, the relative scoring, the relative um, success, quality of the, of the classifier is different. And 
This was um, the result of some research by uh, a team, and they described it this way. If an instrument satisfies predictive parity, i.e. we get it right two thirds of the time for both people, but the prevalence differs between groups, then the instrument cannot ex uh, achieve equal false positive and false negative rates. Okay, so far so research, so interesting. But let's ask ourselves the question, is this model fair? And in order to answer that, you really kind of have to ask yourself the question, why is my sister FaceTiming me? Um, you have to ask yourself the question, um, what are we doing with this model? So what if you decided, I'm going to employ these llamas, and for those who are identified as a tardiness risk, we're going to have more one-on-ones with them. All right. What about if you gave them a lower salary, said, I think you're going to be late more often, so I'm going to pay you less money? Or what if you denied them a job? Or what if you denied them bail? So the story I just told you with cute llamas was actually true. It was um, the result of an investigation by ProPublica that looked into a technology that was used um, in Broward County in Florida, I believe, um, to predict the chance of someone who'd been arrested reoffending, actually rearrested. And what they found was that of those people who were denied bail, the black population were 50% more likely to be denied bail and subsequently not reoffend. So uh, there was a big, a big publication around this. Um, they demonstrated all the ways that this was, you know, endemically not fair. And what happened was the um, producers of the algorithm, uh, North Coast, I think they're called. Um, produced a 37-page response saying, no, 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 no. What we do is totally fair because the precision between these two groups is exactly the same. And so what I want you to think about here is that fairness is not about mathematical correctness. These guys were just arguing at cross purposes about what they thought was important in the accuracy or precision or success or quality of their model. So, when you build models, what I think is really important to do is understand how the different groups in your, in your universe might get affected, ranging from the stakeholders that could be you as the business owner to your customers who are getting offered loans, bank accounts, et cetera, et cetera, also to the people who may be denied those things and have a think about like whether you are whether you're optimizing for the values that you want your system to uphold. Recognize that fairness isn't blind. So for this section, we actually get into surprisingly fintech stuff. Um, uh, a, a gentleman called Morris Hartz and Co. Uh, did some research into FICO scores. And they looked at how protected attributes, excuse me, how protected attributes can't really be ignored when thinking about fairness. So here's what they did. They took about 300,000 TransUnion credit scores. Um, they, for the purpose of this exercise, they marked as a default anyone who subsequently went 90 days in arrears on any of the loans that they had in a, I think it was about a two year period post the, the research date. And they grouped those by um, Asian, black, Hispanic, and white populations. And what they then did is say, let's model this to maximize profit based on some different criteria. Um, so what if we applied no constraint to it at all? Right, we can offer different thresholds to different races, and all we want to do is make as much money as possible. Um, what if we chose a races blind criteria? And we just said everyone gets a cut off at pick your number. Um, what if we said the fairness criteria was equal demography? So we offered the same percentage of loans to each, of each, um, each group. Um, and then a fourth one 
uh, it's actually fifth in the thing, but for simplicity, I'll, I'll talk about it in one, is what if we offered the, or what if we optimized for what we call equal opportunity, which is basically uh, optimizing for the true positive rate. So the, the percentage of people who, who are offered a loan, who subsequently pay off the loan, let's optimize for that number. And this is the results that they saw. And what you can see here, and the thing I want you to take away from this, is providing a single threshold, one, doesn't produce a maximally profitable outcome. Two, it's pretty obvious from this that race is encoded in that FICO score. Otherwise, you would not see what we see here. Um, in case you think this, this takes a lot of unpacking to dig into you know, what this means and profitability, um, the nice folks at Google did a really good visualization of this research, which I'll, I'll sort of show you a couple of excerpts of. Um, so, you know, they simplified into blue, blue audience and orange audience, but uh, they said in the case of um, optimizing for being race blind, a single threshold, uh, you made about $25,500. If you were maximizing for, for profit and decided to um, offer different rates to different races uh, just because, um, you made 32 grand. And if you're offering equal opportunity, that true positive rate, uh, you're making about $30,000. So I think what's important to think about here is I think it's easy for us as technologists and data folk to say, well, my system's fair because all it's doing is representing the data that's fed to it. And my provocation is that I don't think that's okay and I don't think it's good enough. I think it's worth us saying, okay, well, we recognize that the data coming in has some of these things encoded in it. And so it's incumbent upon us to think about like, well, what we might do about, what we might do with that information now we know about it. <laughs> Poke a hole in the black box. So there's two, when people think about decision makers, folks who offer loans or insurance rates or so on, um, I think you would agree that the way we are perce perceived usually falls into two camps. One is that we're callous or malicious. We're just trying to maximize our profit. And the only thing that's preventing us from evil or bad behavior is regulation. Um, yeah, regulation. Um, the other viewpoint, which I would imagine many of us in the room think of ourselves as, is that we as decision makers are fundamentally good. And we want to do the right thing. And inadvertently, we may end up um, having unintentional discrimination in our products, whether we realized it or not. So with best intentions, we may just do things that, that aren't, aren't right. Um, so I guess the provocation here is how might we think about reducing the number of people who think of us as callous, malicious, and evil? And part of the problem is that very often, when we think about the things that we do, we describe it as our special source. This is, it's our proprietary algorithm. We can't possibly tell you about it. Um, we don't want to open it up to scrutiny because if we do, people will game the system. These are all reasonable stances. Um, but what I would say is, if you do that, inevitably, uh, people are going to assume that you are callous. Um, there are ways to, to, to solve this, to, to sort of square the circle here. Um, one of them is there's an emer emerging field of algorithm audits. Um, this is an open source package, Equitas, that can look at your model and help you see if what you're doing is inadvertently biased towards certain protected groups. And the other thing I would say is uh, you know, since we can dream, it would be really nice if some of, <laughs> Alex, you're the only mega corporation I know in the room, so I'm just going to look at you. Um, it would be really nice if uh, 
some of the larger companies in our industry funded independent research into these things. Uh, you know, th this tweet puts it in a particularly snarky way, but like, you know, in her take, um, Facebook are outsourcing part of their business model or, or their sort of business ethics to ProPublica, and it would be really good if, uh, if ProPublica got a hefty donation from Facebook for that. Um, take a walk in another neighborhood. I thought about this, I, I rewrote this about four times. Originally it was the sort of standard product mantra of get out of the building, which you'll see here. Um, which is good and great, and I think we've all heard this before, that you know, go out and speak to your customers and learn from them, and learn what they like, what they dislike, um, what it means for them to go through the world and where their pain points are. Um, certainly extraordinarily valuable. Um, but I'd like to encourage you to sort of take it one step further and go to a different neighborhood. Um, this is Sesame Street, Mexico, by the way. Um, what we did at daylight as an example of this is, you know, we were very keen not to, not to build a bank that was purely for kind of us as employees who are primarily based in New York, San Francisco, wealthy areas, very welcoming to the gay community, to the queer community and so on. And so we chose our offsite to be uh, suburban Indianapolis which is somewhere you would never expect 20 queer and trans folk to go. And we did it very, very deliberately so we could go and speak to the queer community there and the non-queer community and the straight community there and learn what it's like to be gay in a small town. Well, sorry, Indianapolis, maybe not a small town, but somewhere that's not, a, not an East or West Coast elite city, let's call it. Um, exercise your power. I was speaking to a job candidate um, the other day. I was talking to them about, like, why do you want to join this company? and What do you want to do? And what I said to them, and what I would say to all of you, all of you is, you know, as people working in technology, as engineers, we all have immense luxury and immense privilege because we get to choose what problem we want to solve. And so if you think you're working on the wrong problem, or if you think the company you're working at is working on the wrong problems, then you know what? You get to use your voice and you get to exercise your power because um, being the person that's on the end of hiring right now, like you're an extraordinarily valuable resource to your company. This is, uh, um, you know, uh, people at Google um, writing a letter about um, objecting to, um, the use of AI and drone technology, and likewise, Microsoft uh, engineers wrote a, a thing uh, rejecting the idea of working for ICE. A couple of examples, there's many, many more. Um, and I guess this is the sort of shameless point at which I'd say, if you do want to work somewhere that cares about these things, I'm hiring like everyone else, so come, come work for me. It's fun sometimes, most of the time. Um, Lastly, be kind to yourself. Um, I think when you start to think about stepping one bit away from solving the sort of interesting logical problem that many engineering problems are and the interesting human problem that many product problems are, what you realize is day, day in, day out, you're actually really just facing a trolley problem. And you are never going to please anyone, everyone. <laughs> Hopefully you'll please someone. Um, and what you'll find is that the people that you don't please are going to be super vocal. And you'll find it draining, and you'll find it hard. But don't let that put you off from trying to do something to make the world fairer. Um, because if you don't, nothing will change. And you know, to, to restate it, like we have extraordinary luxury and extraordinary privilege working in technology. Um, so do something. Um, so that's it. Um, my quick rundown, respect identity, uh, build your systems to represent human values, 
Recognize that fairness isn't blind. Uh, put a hole in the black box. Strive for some transparency in how your systems work. Uh, take a walk in someone else's neighborhood. Go learn from other people. Uh, if you need to, exercise your power. You can vote with your feet. You can vote with your voice. Um, and be kind to yourself. This stuff isn't easy. It's not, it's, 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 the world's not going to change overnight. But if you don't try, nothing will happen. That's me. Thank you for listening. I guess I'll take questions if you have questions. Yeah, go ahead. That's a really good question. Um, the, the short and unsubtle answer is it varies. I think it's, I'm going to answer that by telling you why I decided to uh, join the company and join Rob and Billy, who had sort of made some early progress. Um, the business was initially described to me as a company that provided financing to folks who were looking for gender affirmation surgery or for surrogacy. And I sort of sat with that for a weekend, and I thought, huh, I don't actually want either of those things for myself, but I definitely would put my assets in a bank that does. And so I want to support a bank that has the value system that I hold true. So I think what we will find is that identity and what we stand for is just as valuable as the features that we offer. Um, you know, if you look at many of the affinity banks, what you'll see at the moment is a very similar set of features. There's differentiation across all of them. We have some differentiating points, as do others. Um, but I think the thing that takes someone to daylight is identity, for sure. Yeah. That's a really good question. Um, what does success look like? Yeah. Um, I want to be able to tell you not only you know, how much we've grown and all of the standard boring, like, yes, we need to do those things, things. Um, I want to be able to tell you the impact we've had on the queer community. And that ranges from. Uh, you know, support we've had at grassroots events to helping people to save for things, to helping people to avoid missing uh, critical medical treatment, to surfacing queer businesses to them so they can go shop there. Um, yeah, so that, that, that's what I would like to be able to tell you in a year from now. I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Oh, yeah, sure. So, um, naively, when I went into this, uh, into this uh, presentation or just started thinking about this, um, I think you find, you find people who start with the opinion of saying, well, I don't see race. And when you think about, um, you know, we take it back to the example of the FICO scores, um, what you need to take on there is that if you, if you, if you use FICO scores in a, in a, in a sort of race-blind way, what you are doing is not necessarily being fair because there's so much encoded into what a FICO score is um, that um, to assume that the data coming in is, is colorblind is, is a fallacy. And so if you want to be fair, you need to also accept that there is, um, there is race encoded in the data with which you build your systems.
All right, well, thank you everyone. Um, really appreciate it. I think there's enough time for you to scoot off to, the, to Wade's chat as well, um, seeing as I'm nice and speedy for you all. Um, if you have any questions, please grab me afterwards. I'm, I'm around. Thank you. Obviously. <laughs>